the storm with signs and wonders you show your power with precious blood you show us your grace you've been our helper our liberator is above every name, the name of his saving majesty, King Jesus, the first and the last. It is because of him why we are here. And it is his voice we want to hear and his touch upon our lives that we want to feel. We have high regard for the handshakes and the hugs and the greetings that we get from each other. But here in this house, am I not right? It is his voice and his touch above everyone else that we want. And so this morning, we ask for his continued presence with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. But Lord, you will be here and we will know that you are here. 
And when we leave here, we will know we were in God's house and in the presence of Jesus. It's good to be back at GCA. And so let me say thanks to Pastor Brian Grant and to Dr. Elijah Corich for inviting me to Philadelphia another time. I have to use this opportunity to say a very big thank you to all of you here who have prayed with my wife and myself and stood by us in the ordeal through which we have passed over the last three years. Those of you who know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about, and the others of you will just have to believe me and thank God. For if I start on that story, I won't get to be preaching, dear brother. But just let me say, thanks for your love, thanks for your prayers, thanks for your encouragement, thanks for your solidarity, thanks for your support at every level. And God has answered prayer with a marvelous, miraculous deliverance of his servant with full exoneration and vindication. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, I'm going to stop there, uh, but um, he deserves a lot more credit and a lot more praise. So let me just join with Pastor Grant this morning in welcoming all of you college students who are with us and any of the professors who are here. We are grateful that you have taken some time out of your busy study schedule to spend this morning with us. And we wish for you the greatest of success in all of your studies, in the disciplines you have chosen, and in your life beyond college. Now, I would like, as an old man who is a father, a grandfather, and a great-grandfather, if you please, I would just like to give you one valuable study tip. And it comes from the Bible. James 1 and verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, then please ask of God, who gives to all generously, and it will be given to you. So I am going to recommend with all of the studies, and the, here and there I may use a Jamaican word. We would say they're all the study ration that you are going through. Just one for you to remember, the help that comes from God in wisdom. Ask for that help and avail yourself of it. Now let me say that although uh, it's a long time since I've been in college, I'm well aware that the atmosphere on our college campuses, generally speaking, seems to me to be somewhat antagonistic to the Christian faith. Not all colleges, by all means, but certainly some. And then, given the pressure, peer pressure, on our college campuses, sometimes our young people forget God. Some will even begin to question His existence. And some will have scant regard for his place and role in their lives. I would just like to say, however, you know, that given the fact that so many of us spend, oh, I would have to count if you put in from the kindergarten days, we probably spend 15, 20 some people, a lot more than that, time getting an education. Now hear this old man now. If all of those years, and some of the parents here would want me to say, and all of the cost for getting that education, 
If when you are finished with that, you are still not prepared for one of life's certain eventualities, then I would suggest that there is something deficient in our education, and you need to take remedial action. Now, I know I've probably alienated some of you there, and I'm going to ask you, stay with me until I'm finished, okay? Today, as we have already recognized, is 9-11. And as Pastor reminded us, and we very appropriately um, reflected on this, 3,000, almost 3,000, persons lost their lives 15 years ago in a major calamity. And I would like this morning for us to read about another one of these kinds of sudden, unexpected calamities that happened right here in Scripture for in the background, we cannot escape it today, is the fact that this is the 15th anniversary of 9-11. And may I just join in case there's anyone here who lost a relative or a friend or somebody you know. Our deep and sincere sympathies remain with you. So turn with me, if you will, please, to Luke's Gospel. Luke's Gospel, chapter 13. And I will be reading from the New King James Version. And before we read, let us pray. Father, we are about to read from your Holy Word. And we realize, of course, that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And your ways are past finding out. With our finite minds, we may miss. We may not hear. We will fail to grasp what you would say to us. And so we ask that the Holy Spirit, the teacher, would be among us now. Hide your unworthy servant behind the cross. And may Jesus Christ be lifted up and hearts be blessed for its sin. His name we pray. Amen. Luke chapter 13 then in verse 1. There were present at that season... Some who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that those Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is the word of the Lord. I prefer to stay down here. Maybe for the last 25 years, I haven't preached behind the pulpit. I just like to be down here. Ladies and gentlemen, young people and older ones of us, life is interspersed with unexpected, horrible, tragedies. Some of these are massive and thousands lose their lives. Some of these are not so massive but folks are equally dead. Some of these catastrophes come from nature. Some would say from mother nature. Like tornadoes and hurricanes, and tidal waves, 
and floods and earthquakes and tsunamis. Some of you here, like me, the first time I ever heard the word tsunami, sounds like a Greek word or something, was Boxing Day, you have to be about my age and good memory. Boxing Day 2004, when there was a major earthquake in the Indian Ocean that spawned a tidal wave that devastated 11 countries. And when the tidal wave had receded and the count was made, the official count you may remember, 230,000 people dead. Suddenly, unexpectedly, ushered into eternity. And then, some of you may remember, for some of you younger ones wouldn't remember that one, but you may remember, um, in, I think it's March 11, 2011, there was an earthquake off the coast of Japan. It spawned a tidal wave and 18,000 persons were ushered suddenly and unexpectedly into eternity. And you will remember that it set off a major nuclear problem that continues the fallout of which continues to trouble the world even today. And then, I think it was in April of this year, we had an earthquake in Ecuador. 232 people dead, went to their beds alive and woke up dead, suddenly and unexpectedly. Some of these catastrophes, as we say, come from nature. Some of them just come from plain human carelessness, misjudgment, human error, or the fact that sometimes we are driving under the influence of something, drugs or alcohol. Or listen, we are texting while we are driving. Or we are distracted by some other gadget and suddenly and unexpectedly catastrophe comes and folks are ushered into eternity. Sometimes it is because of rage and anger and jealousy and somebody takes a gun and kills wife and children and kills himself. Sometimes it is because of terrorism, all too frequently in our time. For 9-11 was the worst terrorist attack on this homeland. Suddenly and unexpectedly, 3,000 persons ushered into eternity. Or who can... Forget the Russian jet that was shot down en route to St. Petersburg. And everybody on board, 200 and plus people, ushered suddenly and unexpectedly into eternity. Or, you remember, June of this year. Orlando and folks are at a nightclub having a good time suddenly and unexpectedly 49 are dead and 51 are injured and just recently in the month of July any one of us here could have been holidaying in Nice France a beautiful place and Mohamed Boulel comes with a 19 ton truck and mows down a crowd of people 84 dead and scores of people injured Sometimes it is just plain old sin and satanic and demonic influence. But whether or not 
people are just as dead. Some are massive with thousands dead. Some not so massive. But folks equally dead. And but for the grace of God, it could have been any one of us. Now please let me just point out, if I point my finger at you, three of them are pointing back at me and I'm very conscious of it. But for the grace of God, any one of us could have been a part of that. So then, I say, my brothers and sisters, the education we spent all these years preparing for, we are preparing for life, but it is not guaranteed. It could be snuffed out in a moment. But one thing for sure, there is an appointment coming. And I'm only saying this morning, if in all the stuff we have achieved, and all the time we spent studying all the books and getting all the degrees, and please, young people, if you have the ability to have a PhD, don't be satisfied with a bachelor's or a master's degree. We want to encourage you to use what skills and talents you have to the best for the honor and glory of God. But if after we have spent all that time preparing to live, and we don't know whether we are going to live and we haven't taken a little time to prepare to die I am only saying to us what I say to my children and my grandchildren something is deficient in our preparation and we need to take remedial action because I ask myself what if it were me? What if it were any one of us here? Where would we be today? Where would we be today? Now I know for some people they're saying, I would be six foot six in the ground. I think they still give you that depth. Or I would probably be in a vault someplace. They would bury my body and that's where it would be. But I want to say to us, that's not real, that's not true. We are more than the animal that we bury in the ground. We are more than the, I nearly wanted to say dog, but please, anybody might think I'm insulting. We are more than the animal we put in the ground. Every single culture, every generation of people from recorded time have all had an innate conviction that there is more to me than just the flesh and bones and blood. Everyone. I come from the island of Jamaica. So occasionally, you know, you can't quite escape your roots. Even people who are very sophisticated, who, no, don't say duppies, Jerry. Yeah. Don't say ghosts. But isn't it true? Isn't it true? And some of the great writers of literature have immortalized some ghosts in their stories. There is something primordial, innate to all of us, that says, when this body is put in the ground, you are not burying Jerry Gallimore, only the house in which he lived. You are not burying me. The essence of who you are, of who I am, is spiritual. And I am only saying, when they put me in the ground, the essence. In fact, you will come and ask Pastor Grant, where is the body? You're not coming to ask Pastor Grant, where is Jerry Gallimore? Where is the body? Somewhere, somehow, we understand that the real essence of what makes me, me, and what makes you, you, is gone someplace. Gone someplace. And this for me is serious, young people, for the Bible indicates to me that there are only two places that people go when they die. Only two places. Now, with respect to 
college folks. I know that to suggest that there are only two places you writing me off right away. For that sounds narrow and bigoted. And how we, 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 we don't believe in absolutes anymore. Everything is relative. We don't believe in absolutes anymore. But isn't it true? While we declare we don't believe in absolutes, that belief is now the new absolute. And tolerance and relativism have become the new absolute. I am only saying, notwithstanding, my Bible tells me only two places that folks go when they die. They either go to heaven or they go to other that other place. It's a four-letter word. I wouldn't say it in decent company. I wouldn't say it in chapel. A four-letter word. So let me read for you what Jesus says, for that is far better than I would have put it. Matthew 25, 46. Jesus says, Some go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Same difference, you know. Same too. Everlasting punishment or eternal life. Different terminology, but we're still talking about the same place. You either go to heaven or that other four-letter word, Lord, that would be uncomfortable to say to nice, in nice, decent company. What I would say to us, however, the word everlasting sounds like a very long time. And the word eternal sounds like a very long time. If we spend all these years preparing to live, I am 78 now by the grace of God. Thank you, Jesus. But what is that compared to eternity? If we spend all this time preparing to live and we have no guarantee about the rest of today or tomorrow, I am only saying to all of us this morning, it makes sense to take some time to work on what, where I go in the hereafter. Yes, really in my view, very important. You know, you say to folks, you ask them questions about almost anything. Ask folks a question about the economy. Ask them about politics right now. Ask folks about global warming. Ask us about pollution. Ask us about sports. And we tend to have some definitive answer. But ask us about where we will spend eternity. And we get all fuzzy. We get all fuzzy with our, or very vague, or very unsure. We get silent, or we get positively embarrassed, or some other emotion, like some of you may be feeling right now towards me. Folks get very irate when you ask this question, for they see it as the ultimate intrusion into their privacy. And I understand that. And the folks are still civil with you. And you ask them, are you going to go to heaven when you die? They will probably answer, I hope so. I hope so. I don't know. I'm working on it. I'm not so sure. And sometimes, even when folks say, yes, I know where I'm going. And I say to you, my brother, on what basis you say yes? That's when we get fuzzy again and vague again. And we get positively angry. But the thing is, if you ask me, or ask anybody here, do you have a job? Usually the answer is yes or no. 
If you ask me or you ask other folks here, are you married? I am married to the same woman for 53 plus years, but I must stop. Yes, I am married. I know I am married. Are you going to heaven when you die? We get fuzzy and very unsure. We don't really know. Isn't it true that most of us, when we are going on a journey, we know where our destination is? When I leave here tomorrow, if I leave by the grace of God, I am headed for Florida. But not just Florida, I'm headed for Pembroke Pines. But not just Pembroke Pines, I'm headed for 11998 Northwest 13th Street. That is where I live. Most of us, when we are going on a journey, we know what our destination is. But ask the same person about your final destination. And again, we get fuzzy. We get embarrassed, we get silent, or we get irate. And when we ask folks about going to heaven, the truth is that when we do get an answer, again, it's kind of fuzzy. Watch this. How do people get to heaven? How, how does a man or a woman get to heaven? The answers that I tend to get, number one, Doing the best we can. I'm sure you have heard that too. Doing the best we can. If they are religious, they might tell you, keep the Ten Commandments. Or some might say, do well, be kind to your fellow man. I get that one too. Or somebody might say, you want to go to heaven, join a church and come to church every Sunday. Somebody else might give us some other kind of answer. And I would say those are good answers, but they are not good enough. They are good answers. You have come close, but you still miss the mark. And hear me, brothers and sisters, for the clock is telling me it's time to finish, and I'm not finished yet. But the, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, no. For a lot of those statements that are being made come out of the notion that we can earn heaven. That we can work our way into heaven. That brother Brian, if we do enough good deeds, one of these days, God is going to let us into heaven because we have done enough Good deeds and a whole host, even of church people and religious people, feel that way. But of course, this is coming again from out of uh, the human mind that says this is just and reasonable. My brothers and sisters, this is religion. This is religion. Religion is the whole system of things that men and women do in order to placate a God whom they may perceive as being angry with them. The things that we do to work ourselves up. Things that we do to score credits and to earn favor with that God. Religions are built on that basis. But my Bible tells me that uh, this eternal life is a gift from God. It is a gift from God. I can't work for it. I can't earn it. It is not a reward that God gives me at the end of my life. And some of you are saying, Brother Jerry, are you really trying to tell me that God is not going to weigh the good against the bad? And if the good outweighs the bad, then I go to heaven. If the bad outweighs the good, you go to that place with four letters that we won't talk about in decent company. Are you telling me that? Well, I am saying surprise, surprise. The Bible says something else. This is the difference between Christianity and all the other religions of the world. The religions of the world have a whole system of what we must do to 
move up and reach up to God and to please that God. Christianity is about God coming down to me. He knows my bankruptcy. He knows my flaws. He knows my sins. He knows I can do nothing to save myself. And with all of my warts and all of my flaws and all of the ugliness and the shame and guilt and pollution of my life, the Bible says, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son so that whosoever believeth may have eternal everlasting life. Ladies and gentlemen, eternal life, according to the scripture, is a gift from God. We can't work it up. We won't deserve it by the good deeds. And if you're counting on that, you will never have peace. For how many good deeds does it take for you to feel you are okay? with God. But thank God. Here's what the scripture says to me. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved. Listen, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. I don't know if it can be clearer than that. Look, if it was of works, can you imagine when I get to heaven and see Brian Grant turn up? Brian, you made it. You made it. Let me tell you about what I did. Do you see that heaven wouldn't be heaven anymore? It probably wouldn't be heaven for him, for if I have a hundred good deeds and he only has 45, then he's deficient and I have rank over him. No, thank God, the basis of my salvation is a gift from God. And whether you're rich or you're poor, whether you're educated or you're ignorant, whether you're white or black, whether you're a student, you're young, middle-aged, or you're an old man like myself, it's a gift from Almighty God. Wow. I feel like saying hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Otherwise, I would not be here. I wouldn't be here today. Wouldn't be here. And neither would a whole lot of us here. No, it's not on the basis of good deeds. I'm not doing good deeds to earn my salvation. Now, God looked down from heaven and saw the needs of each one of us and knew there was nothing you nor me could do to save ourselves. He sent us a rescuer. He sent us a savior. He said they can't do anything to save themselves or clean up the mess. Sin is a problem. And Jesus Christ came and lived amongst us and went to the cross and he suffered in my place on that cross every sin that I committed every sin that all the rest of us have committed he God poured it on Jesus there's a scripture that makes me tremble and he became sin for us with all of its pollution and all of its ugliness and all of its vileness he became sin for us and God punished Jesus Christ for the sins that Jerry Gallimore did and he died and they buried him but he didn't stay dead he came back from the grave and now he gives the gift of salvation and of eternal life. I don't have to work for it. I don't have money to pay for it. Jesus said it's been paid for already. It's all paid for already. 
Salvation is free, but it's not cheap. It cost God the death of his son. But when he died upon the cross, he took your sins and mine. And sin is the problem between myself and God. And he took the wrath of God and the punishment of God that I deserved. And now he says to me, you need to receive the gift that I won for you. That I paid for, for you. You don't need to try to earn heaven on your own. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You want to go to heaven? You want to come to the Father? Come by me. It's a free gift. Now, the thing is that this, in a sense, sounds too simplistic. For our minds when you think of all that we have heard and some folks for them the way to get to heaven you must have somebody give you the last rites at the right moment all good but not good enough jesus says you can join me in heaven oh pastor you're going to throw me out for this now even if you're not a member of a church you can join me in heaven even if you never paid tithes. You can join me in heaven even if you've never been baptized. Can you believe that? For Jesus says to a man, a murderer, a malefactor, a man who was a sinner suffering for his sins on the cross beside him. We have no evidence he ever went to church. He's dying because he's a bad man. But he received gift of eternal life and Jesus says today today you are going to be with me no ladies and gentlemen young people it's not because of how good we are or how hard we try to placate and please that God it's on the basis of what Jesus and Jesus alone has done and that is enough. Oh boy, yeah, I must finish now. I must finish now. But if you ask me right now, preacher, so what do you want me to do with what you've been talking about? Number one, the scripture says you need to hear it. You need it to have heard it. Faith comes by Hearing the word of God. You need something for the basis of your faith. And here it is that God in heaven loves you and me. No matter who doesn't like us. That God in heaven loves you and me. I'm special to him. Take a good look. And I only do that because you can say exactly the same thing. I'm special to him. Lord have mercy, special enough for him to send his one and only son. If I was the only sinner on earth, he would have died for me. You have to be with me sometimes because when that hits me, oh, I, I, I don't know what to say or do or how to express myself. To say, God, what a value you put on sinners like myself. That Jesus died, that I may have eternal life. And have the gift of life. So you need to hear it. And then secondly, you need to believe it. We need to believe Jesus is not just another prophet in the whole um, range of prophets. He's the son of God. 2,000 plus years ago, he came down to earth on a mission to rescue you and you and you and me. For we couldn't do it for ourselves. And so now that he's paid the price and all of heaven is available as a free gift, we need to just come to him and say, Lord, you're giving that gift. I want to receive that gift. For I believe you are the son of God. You came to heaven from heaven to die for the sins of the world. But you're not saved yet. I am. One of those sinners. I acknowledge that you died in my place. And I receive you 
as my Lord and Savior to become a Christ follower from this day on. He gives the gift and I receive it and Lord, I just now I'm ready to preach what a transaction that takes place in that moment. Something happens in that moment when you do that for I am given the gift of eternal life. I become a child of God. My name is written down says the book of Revelation in the Lamb's book of life. I have a place in heaven. I want you to know I've become a child of a king. And now I go to church and I read the Bible and I am faithful in my stewardship and I seek to be kind and to do works of charity. I seek to do all of those things not in order to be saved but because he has saved me. Yes. And so, the good works that I'm concerned to do is not in order to win God's favor, but because I have God's favor on my life. I want to live like a child of God. I want to live like a child of the King. I want to walk and hold myself with the dignity that he invested when he made me in his own image. You know how many times, oh look, I'm in trouble. You know how many times I say to my, my three children, yeah, I want you to remember, you're a Gallimore. Folks expect you to live like Jerry Gallimore's child. And every once in a while, Father says to me, you belong to me. You're a member of my family. Folks expect you to live a certain way, and so do I. But not in order to become his child, but because I am. I am. And so here we are today. And I'm only saying, on this 9-11 day, my brothers and sisters, stuff happens. Bad stuff happens. Some sudden unexpected tragedies and thousands lose their lives some are not so big but folks are equally dead eternity is a long time are you ready now clearly none of us thank God were at 9 11 15 years ago for then of course we wouldn't be here today. Thank God none of us were on the Russian plane that was shot down out the sky by terrorist activity. Thank God we were not in the nightclub in Orlando that when that tragedy happened. Thank God we weren't vacationing in Nice, France, when the man came and mowed down 84 dead. But we could have been, but for the grace of God, we might have been. Do you get the burden on my heart? I'm just saying, we need to take some steps to be ready for that day. For we do not know when it may come. Father, I pray that it, no tragedy, no calamity, nothing happens to anybody here. I pray. But Jesus said that day, I don't want any of you to think that it's because the people were so bad why these things happen to them religious people doing their ceremony of animal sacrifice and that bad governor comes along and kills them and mingles their blood with the sacrifices animal parts and human parts the other 18 Jesus said we don't know if they were building the tower or they were just standing by the tower but the world trade tower came down on them and they are dead and Jesus said, I don't want you to think it's because they were so bad. They were just like the rest of you. But unless you do something, the words of Jesus 
a similar calamity could await you. Pastor, I know it's time to quit and I'm done. But here today, I'm just asking God that all of us would have a sense of wisdom. I want to live, live, live until I die. I don't want to die a day before that. And I would pray the same for all of you. But this afternoon and tomorrow is not guaranteed. The Lord laid this on my heart. I've taken a long time to discharge it. But I've said it to you today. If you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Maybe God brought you to church today for Jesus to just wave the flag and say, watch it. Those people who died, they are no worse than you or the rest of us. But unless we do something, we too could have a similar peril. Or maybe he sent me here, Pastor. I knew it was college day, and I spent a lot of my time working with young people, but I couldn't escape that it is 9-11 as well. And so I asked, let us bow our heads in prayer. Take a moment. Think about the implications of this for you or for me. Do you have any idea where you would be today if but for the grace of God you could have been in any one of those places? I commend all of us for the wise and necessary action that we do to secure our education and a future that will make all the rest of us proud. But in getting all of that, please take a few moments. Take the time that it takes to establish a connection with God. Jesus is here with a free gift of eternal life and salvation with your name on it. Don't leave here unready and unprepared. Nothing more is required of us for he has paid it all and done it all except to say, Jesus, I am the sinner for whom you died. I believe you are God's son who died in my place. And I ask for your forgiveness. And I receive the gift of salvation you offer us. And he does the rest. He does the saving. He comes into life. He makes the changes. And he gives you the peace. So that we can leave here without the morbid fear. Notice the word morbid for there is a natural fear but without the morbid fear as to what is my future if God forbid some unexpected thing should happen. All right, I must stop. Father, we bow our heads in your presence. Lord Jesus, we say thanks to you that you came and you went to the cross. You took the punishment we deserved. You died in our place. You exhausted the wrath of God for everyone who will receive the gift that you paid for in full by your death on the cross. Lord, I pray today if there is anyone here, young, middle-aged, or older, that all of us would leave from here with a deep inner peace in our hearts. That it is well with my soul. And I am ready for death 
which makes me ready to live for we can live without morbid fear when we have put our trust in you. Mm -hmm.